Okay, so let's have a look at this unit, which is uh, threat analysis. So the key objectives of this unit are to understand the basic steps that an intruder might take uh, upon an intrusion, to give a background in the usage of vulnerability scanning, to outline some key current threats and their operation, and to provide some practical skills in vulnerability analysis. Okay, so the f first thing that we're going to look at is penetration testing. With that, we use some tools to be able to see if there are vulnerabilities within inside an organisational infrastructure. So there's some definitions that, that we have here. So a white hat is often seen as, the, as a good ethical hacker, whereas a black hat is someone who has malicious intent. Someone who is good and bad is seen as a grey hat. And a blue hat is someone who does testing for software bugs. Some of the people who might uh, be involved in uh, malicious activities include a hacktivist who has a, a political agenda, a whacker who focuses on wireless lands, a freaker who hacks telephone systems, a software cracker who tries to reverse engineer software applications, script kiddies who often don't have a great deal of skills and who use standard scripting tools and then there are crackers who are motivated by financial gain and have a criminal intent. So often we define a target of evaluation and it's up to the, the white hat to evaluate the system for its vulnerabilities. So this could be in terms of white box evaluation. That is where we know uh, the complete workings of the target of interest and can obviously craft an evaluation strategy based on that. There is grey box where we have a partial knowledge of the target of evaluation and we have black box where there is no knowledge of the actual target of evaluation. So some of the key objectives and terms that we have is risk, which is the likelihood of an occurrence of something that could cause harm, loss or damage. There's a threat, which is something that could harm, lo cause loss or damage. There's an asset, is something that the organisation owns. A vulnerability is a weakness in a system, and an exploit is an entity that takes advantage of a weakness in a system. So for this evaluation, we have an evaluator, which will often send data packets into the target of, uh, of evaluation. Some evaluation software that we can use include Nmap, HPing, and Nessus, and we'll see some examples of these later on. So a key thing that we need is to have a code of ethics and a good code of ethics is defined as not to exceed the authorization limits, to be ethical in everything done and to limit the possible damage while maintaining confidentiality. So there's often three main levels of testing. The first one is a high level test and there is no hands on test on here. This is often looking at schematics documentation, uh, previous logs and so on. Then at level 2 there's a network evaluation which typically involves information gathering, scanning and vulnerability assessment. And then finally we might have a level of penetration testing which involves taking an adversarial role. So some of the things that the White Hat might focus on is social engineering, stolen equipment attack, physical entry attack, and inside their attack, and also outside their attacks. And some of the key skills involved include the configuration of routers, firewalls, Windows operating system, network protocols, and, and so on. So the one key uh, focus is on the CIA principle. 
C stands for confidentiality, where only authorised entities can access sensitive data, and that includes locked doors, fences, firewalls, passwords, encryption, VPN access, and so on, to keep the data private. Then we have integrity, and that uh, focuses on changes of data by unauthorised entities is detected and also authorised entities can only change sensitive data. And then we have availability where only authorised entities have continual access to the data. For this we can have mirror servers and fall failover equipment. For integrity we can have access control, Windows file protection, checksums and network operating systems. So why? Well, there are many audit compliance regimes and these outline some of the, the key audit compliance regulations. In the US, uh, we have Cerber Noxley's, which uh, relates to transparent accounting and reporting of, compa of companies. We have the Patriot Act, which uh, allows the government to monitor hackers without a warranty. And we have other ones such as the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. In healthcare, we have HIPAA, and so on. So the key thing before any any testing occurs is that there's written or permission from the organisation. Then there's a scope definition. The assessment is performed, and then the final stage is the post-assessment activities such as documentation and meetings with the organisation. OK, so a key feature in any system is not to allow an intruder to get to a profit stage. So we need to be able to detect the initial stages of an intrusion. And typically we'll see a standard set of activities before an intruder gets to a profit stage. So this might involve outside reconnaissance, looking up DNS records, IP information. Then there will be some, there could be some inside reconnaissance, such as looking at uh, the sub-network layout, where network devices are, and so on. Then uh, to to find uh, an exploit, such as uh, a weak password or breaching a firewall. From here. Uh, the intruder can gain a foothold onto the system and possibly advance up the levels of privilege and then finally onto the profit stage. So if possible we want to be able to detect at an early stage of these activities such as when there is an inside reconnaissance or the, when there's a probing for an exploit. So typical signs of malicious activity uh, include TCP UDP scans and with this an intruder would scan a, a, a host for open TCP and UDP ports. So we can see in this case try to open port 10, port 11, port 8888 and, and so on. And each host typically has ports that it's listening on and the intruder can possibly find it points of connection to the host through these ports. So nstat minus a will be able to tell us which ports are actually open. Another f uh, sign of surveillance is a ping sweep where an intruder will sweep the computers on a network to see which ones are alive or not. And then we can have an intruder probing for a, a weak password. And in this case, we, the intruder sends in logins for different usernames and, and passwords. This is known as an account scan. Problems that we can have here is anonymous logins, the same password, same password as the user's ID, a password of password using root login, using system default logins, weak passwords, well-known passwords and also social engineering where an intruder might actually try 
and approach a user and ask them for their password. Okay, so if uh, an organization uh, wants to be safe from external and internal threats, then sometimes they need to perform a vulnerability analysis to make sure that their systems are watertight. So certain organizations publish these vulnerabilities on a regular basis, such as for U US CERT, and they have numbers, a vulnerability note number, and to publish them on uh, a website. So in this case we have a vulnerability number, it gives a basic overview of it, a description of it, the impact, a solution, and then the systems that are actually affected. So it's important for organisations to keep up to date with these things and hopefully to patch their systems so that they are not exposed to uh, external threats. The Nessus database is another useful source and we have a CVE ID for this. So you can see that in this case we have a vulnerability for Microsoft Internet Explorer for a cross for a, a cross scripting attack. Defines when it's published and also the severity level. One set of tools that we can use to scan a system for vulnerabilities is Nessus. And this shows an example here with Nessus. What we do is we, def we define a policy, we then create an instance of the policy, run it, and then we get a report back. So in this case we can see the policy is to do a port scan, we'll do a TCP scan, ping the host, and, and so on. So we can create our policies and then an instance of it and then run it. So let's look at a demo of this, of Nessus. Okay, what we have here is a virtual image of Windows Server 2008 and we can see here the address is 192.168.75.130. This is a private address so our scanning through Nexus will be done with inside the virtual image and what we'll do is we'll actually have a look to see which ports that we've actually got open so we can see in this case the ports where we have something listening it's port 23 so we have a telnet server so let's see if we can just prove that that port actually exists. So on our normal machine, what we'll do is we'll just try and turn it in to that address, 168. And our address is 75 .130 see here that we have a, a telnet connection so that's working okay we should also have a web server running from from that address and uh, we go to 192.168.75.130 and there we see we have a, a web server running on here okay so this this virtual image is giving us a, a telnet port and also a web service so what we'll do now is that we'll go to nexus if we can find it ah sorry i've just uh, stopped it so what we'll do is we'll just run it now so Nexus, the Nexus scanner allows us to use uh, a web browser to, to connect and do a vulnerability scan. Uh, 
so I've created a user here and we just log in and we'll just delete these reports that we've created earlier Right, so what we'll do is we'll define a, a policy. So in this case we can add a policy, but there's a policy already created. And we'll just have a look at that policy. You can see the here that's a port scan, it's used gonna use a, a TCP scan. And we'll just accept all the, the defaults there. There are other credentials that we can use and various various plugins. But we'll just do a, a generic TCP scan just now. So then what we do is we just add our scan here. And we'll call it my scan. And this should show you all the policies that we have. And we're going to scan our virtual image here. So our virtual image is at this address. 192.168.75.192.168.75. Seventy-five dot one thirty, and we'll just launch that as a scan. So it'll take it take some time for the scan to complete. Uh, so it's just running just now, and we can have a look at how it's getting on. Just takes a little minute to to the scan. So this is the virtual image here. And this is our local host, and we can see here it's, it's now running. And it's already discovered port 139, uh, port 4445, and, and so on. So as it goes through, it should hopefully discover the other ports that are open. And we can see a few more coming through here. Just have a look over here to see if it's getting the right ports. And the ports it should discover are 2380, 135, 137, 445. So we can see here that, it, that it's getting these, these correct. This has shown us the, the current connections that, that we have. So we can now have a look at each of the ports in, in some, some detail. So we can see here that uh, that we can use Nessus to actually scan our our host. Another method we can use is to use Nmap. Okay, so these these are some of the options that that we can actually use. So we'll do nmap verbose and we want to scan 192.168.75.130 And we can see here that nmap has found port 139, there's port 80 so the, the main services that are open are Telnet, HTTP, MSRPC, and, and so on. Another vulnerability testing tool that we can use is, is Nmap. And Nmap allows us to scan uh, an external host for the ports that it has open, its operating system, and and so on. So we can see in this case, Nmap has scanned a number of uh, ports, and then we've used Snort in this case to be able to detect the scanning. And the preprocessor that we use within Snort is FS Port Scan. We run snort and then that is able to then detect the scan. 
Okay, so let's look at a demo of this. Another threat that we can have is inference. With inference, we have uh, we have some data, and certain accesses to the data are barred. But unfortunately, there can be ways that an intruder can infer information from different queries on a database. Okay, so let's take an example. So in this case, uh, we are disallowed from summing up the ages of all the users on a database. But unfortunately, the query that's allowed to go through is where the gender is male. We do a sum of the ages and then we do the same again for female and when added together we actually get the query which was not allowed which is the sum of the ages. Okay, so let's have a look at, at this. Okay, so there's there's our table here, and what we'll do is we'll make an SQL query. We just have a look at this in as a query. Okay, so first what we'll do is we'll search for the sum of the ages, so that's age here, on the address table where the gender is female. So we can see that's 60. And now what we'll do is we'll do the same query. This time we'll, we'll make this male. And run the same query again. And it's 100. So it's 160 is the total age. And we can see here that that is the same as the sum of all the ages on the database. Another way that an intruder might actually infer information is to run a direct attack and this is where the intruder actually hides a query within a bogus condition. So we can see in this case that the intruder is trying to find out the address of Bob but possibly the the query that query is not allowed. But in this case then this condition will always be false with ages less than 30 or and the ages greater than 30 is a non-valid condition. So this should only show the address of Bob because this condition will always be false. So if we run this condition run this SQL query, we can see here that we get Bob's address. Okay, so we get this uh, condition. If, if an intruder is barred from uh, from getting a number of rows then often what they can do is use the same technique as before so in this case the user returns all the names uh, for for f for females okay so we get bob and eve and then can do the same again for male. We run that again and we can see here that the intruder now has all the names on the database. One method that can be used to uh, increase the security on the database is to use poly instantiation and with this we actually create two records for one record that we're trying to protect so in this case we have a low security version where the date of birth in this case is not is not entered we also have the same record for the same person uh, with a high security version. 
So someone accessing with low security will see the database with this record in it. Someone who accesses with a high security will see this record. And this way we can keep the two levels separate. Okay, so what we're going to see here is an example of cross script, cross scripting uh, with an example of uh, an SQL injection. So we've set up uh, an ESPX page here. It's a fairly simple page. It basically just has a, a data grid and is bound to a database. Just takes a little minute. Uh, we have a virtual image here that we're going to modify uh, so we can get the IP address of the actual virtual image so it's 75.132 so we're going to contact this this image from our desktop okay so we have a data grid here and then we've associated page load and so in this case we've created an SQL database and the table is db1 of which uh, there is a first name surname test1 and test2 so the connection to the database is made here so it's uh, Napier is the image and SQL Express and that creates our SQL connection the database that we've created is called sample. So in the first case what will happen is that uh, it's a simple SQL command to basically just read from the database. It will then e execute that command and then we bind the results of that to our data grid. So what we'll do is we'll initially contact our server here. 168 and we just check to see what the IP address is so 75 132 so what we should see is the default home page and, and there it is so with inside our virtual image our default website is here and we have an IIS start.html. The files that we've created are here and it's called database sample.aspx. So the first program is called database sample.aspx. So you can see here that this has contacted our virtual image and given us our database reading. So we can see there's there's five rows in the table. So what we'll do now is we'll now check out our insert command just to see if it works. So what we're doing here is that uh, we're, we're creating a new row with inside our table and this is an example of an insert row and so we'll give Fred Smith 3 15 25 and 35 so insert into our table these values okay so we'll just save that and now what we'll do is we'll just run it again and we don't actually see anything because we, we haven't done a, a, a select so we'll bring that command back in and we'll save and now when we look again 
our, digi our database has been updated with our new ROM. Now what we'll do is we'll take, we'll bring in a check for the parameter. So in this case it does a, a query on the past parameters with, a, with inside the, the, U, the URL string. So in this case it will look for the word test. So now we'll bring in back this one. So if there are parameters passed, then it will feed the parameter into the the actual page as an SQL command. So what we'll do now is we will do a, we'll do our SQL injection here. Okay, so let's look at okay, some so we'll back current here. threats. And to pass parameters, one of the most difficult to, to detect against are botnets. So now this will take the value of the botnet. Test. What we have is a string, a botnet a mask and the command. So we can and see uh, here a number of botnets actually done the agents. same thing. So these botnet now agents are controlled by the botnet master. So they can Another call back, command, just that we'll speak to the botnet so master, and the botnet master sure can send them a command such as to infect right other hosts or a study to over activate them 10 days in 2009 and by and so this is defined as control by the University of California that we actually found and there was a basic taxonomy of, of the bots defines which gathered their over seven basic characteristics of data. So this so included we have over obviously the attacking behaviour of the bot yes. and the so this could be such sending a synth log in for a distributed uh, for service or it could be for a to ten user theft. accounts. So the bot could steal usernames and, and passwords account. or it could I can see attack on the other other system. So this is from the infected this means that host this command the twenties are we have the this command here and control instruction directly and, and the this is the method that the botnet master the uses to control the bot the page slaves and performed uh, could be a centralized model search, such as using uh, went straight through where the database. bots so now contact we'll a single to show botnet master that is possible or could be on a peer to peer based command and control or could even be a, a random one. Another row we have rallying mechanisms and with this we define the way in which the botnet slaves rally around the botnet master. We'll take this. So this could be a hard-coded IP this address where the, our new the bots SQL. actually know which IP address to uh, contact. Okay, so all that should have could be the the dynamic the DNS test. domain name. We've commented that, or it could be a distributed role. DNS service. If you go back here, the communication protocols that it, that they use is obviously important as to how they communicate okay, so with between the bot and the botnet master. Right. Right. It's because important that, that we set up mechanisms to be able to that. detect this type of, of activity. Okay, so that typically in the past it's been an IRC uh, channel where bots subscribe to the IRC channel. Get but often uh, these days IRC is, back is banned on here. this was the role that uh, organizational the networks. Okay. So and increasingly they're moving towards peer to peer methods and HTTP. Uh, because they can typically get through the firewall. And that shows an example. Could also be instant messenger, SQL, uh, and so on. Then we have the evasion methods. So this might relate to them being encrypted or obfuscated in some way. They might communicate through IPv6 tunneling uh, or even voice over IP tunneling. And then we also have other observable activities which might relate to how they run on the host, such as what files they, they copy and use, which threads they create, and what the network trace looks like. So for us it's important that we can actually characterize our, our botnet to be able to detect its operation, either in its attacking behavior, its evasion method, other observable activities, rallying and also its command and control. So 
with uh, with a with a botnet, what we can have is a, a crime such as this could occur, where where uh, someone is redirected to to a fake bank login. Then the details of the login is taken and sent to a botnet master. That botnet master finds a botnet with inside the country that the bank is based, and the botnet is then given a command to withdraw the money after which the money transfer is made and the remote criminal gang can actually uh, profit from, from this. So it's a worrying threat in that botnets could be dormant on many machines waiting to be awoken by the botnet master. Some research done recently on the Torpig, uh, the, the Torpig botnet identified uh, that there was uh, many Another particularly difficult current threat is phishing. So with phishing, uh, an, in, an external intruder will often fish for user data. So in this case, we can see here we have a perfectly valid looking email that's sent. Uh, but unfortunately, it's fairly easy to spoof email addresses so in this case we have a spoofed email address. The other thing is that uh, this is a, is a graphic which looks rather strange and it's obvious that uh, the intruder is sending it through the spam checker so the spam checker can't really read the text with inside the, the graphic. Along with this when we when we take, move our, our cursor over the message, we can see here that the actual link that has been sent is an IP address on a strange looking port. Where this, so in this example, we're going to use link not that shown the text, but a when it's clicked from on and it goes to this other link. When we so do a, a lookup, we actually find we that it doesn't resolve to the domain it's that not here we're within say, the virtual image. For. So we can see this as an example of a trap door. When we look at the details of the, the message, we can actually see that the email itself has came from a non-verified source. And also the okay, so we've created a some rules here to mean to send prepared from. So initially what we'll do is that we'll just detect 
Increasingly, um, there's there's a move towards pressurized so the fishing, ICMP, and with pressurized fishing, on any the user sends a message, which so puts some pressure that. on the user to act instantly. So in this case, we can see that the message has been crafted, in which the user okay, is so being prompted to apply as quick as possible from any network, uh, or there will be left to bad feedback the network on eBay. So, so some users will be tricked we'll with this into thinking that it's a valid looking email. So everything looks fine here. And so we can see yeah, here it looks like it's from member it has at read in the the rules UK, file. But when uh, and it has one the recipient one rule clicks to here, detect, then their details won't go to EB but will go listening. to uh, the intruder. So the we can see a problem IP that address here that we have here and that the actual login goes again inside the virtual image to this URL one but to one nine two one six eight another external one seventy five dot one three same again with this we can see here that uh, there is a, a request for that okay, someone so has changed the password to, log to the bill folder and the user has been prompted to click on the left to resolve the file and now unfortunately once they do this alert then it will go off to a malicious site and there's the content so you can see here it's picked up okay so we can pain. have uh, problems Six. echo uh, like this so it's picked up one there is a three four. a response required when we actually look or echo at our which corresponds to the four HTML pings that or this we email actually we actually sent. find that click on the on this button okay. sends the user quit user details then to we see four alerts script now what we'll do which is, is always try used to gather to, uh, uh, scan the port fishing the machine details. to see if there's any vulnerabilities so we'll open up our rules file again and more and more we see examples of complete sites being copied and in this case so well it's very difficult for a user to tell that it isn't a valid one so in this case we can see here all the graphics preprocessor all rule the and tabs and so on are have actually been taken out. from the real site so in this case but this we have a high sensitivity a malicious fs port link. scan which is a preprocessor that will be able to detect so what to look for sweep. Basically, Just when sure uh, there is an email which requests a username and password, and that's fine. This is so highly unlikely to happen from a valid again. business. When there's graphics which are used to display here, the text, we'll run Nmap. often uh, scan for the there will be system. poorly laid out graphics content, One and an IP address two, one six inside eight, a, a web link. One three two. Also, we should look for a domain. Let's take a little minute on the web, which differs from the sending scan. domain. Obviously, it runs any links slower because we're in a virtual image. But where there are here, graphics content, there are many ports open from an image. external site from within the site. Then email. hopefully over here. And one we now see when that the iframes are used within site to get some email content. In. So we can see here the scan with iframes. Was what we get here. is a single tag from called an iframe tag dot one and with this and we this the is our machine, machine here can very virtual image external and we can see here that uh, it's site contact scan external site with inside a valid from port page. seven up to so port in this case sixty one thousand nine hundred here is taken from okay, so that's an external an site of the and then body rule site and also this for page. the so an iframe is a particular worry in that we may think that we're scan. accessing a certain site, but intruder may okay, so forever struggling in to know which port from that we want to another to site. Receive on, we do snort minus big W. You can see here, this is the connection here that we're listening on.
Another major threat that we have from outside is where an intruder might try to pa crack a password on a system. On our side, we can use vulnerability scanning to make sure that there aren't any weak passwords that someone could exploit. But this area should be treated with extreme caution. And the problem that we have is that uh, we have a certain entropy for passwords. So the more characters that we have, the stronger the password becomes. But unfortunately, most people use passwords which are fairly well known from a standard dictionary. One way to assess the strength of a password is to measure its entropy in bits. And this is the equivalent key size if it was an encryption key. And what we do is that we look at the number of possible passwords that we have and then take log to the base two of it and we can find the equivalent number of bits. So from a, from a password generation, then the number of permutations in this case that we can have is 2 to the power of 4.3. And we need to make sure that we have a large enough space for our passwords to make it more difficult to crack. So for example, if there's only uh, 256 b uh, phrases, then that's only equivalent to an 8-bit key. One program which can be used to assess a vulnerability is the Hydra program, which should be used with extreme care and only for finding loopholes. A black hat could use this program to scan our systems. So in this case, uh, a number of passwords and a number of login IDs have been used to assess for uh, an FTP server. And we can see that uh, a password has been found.
Okay, so let's look at uh, one of the vulnerability tests that we can actually run. So what we have is a Linux image here. And we should find that in here we have a few services running. So the services that we have running in the Linux image include FTP, Telnet, Web and so on. And then what we're going to do is run Hydra from the Windows image. So we'll just find the Hydra folder first. Here we are. So we have Hydra here. And then what we're going to do is that we're going to run a Hydra vulnerability test from the Windows image into the Linux image. So we'll just find out what the interface address is and it's 75.137 okay so it's 192.168.75.137 okay so we'll just we'll just run nmap to see if we can see the services that are running with inside the Linux image and while we're doing that we'll just run Hydra over here so Hydra itself can actually investigate a wide range of Protocol. Okay, so that is the end of and the threat analysis here are some unit. Yeah. So hopefully uh, you will have a better understanding of the basic steps than so we have take the service take an intrusion. The service itself. Basic can back be end in the usage of vulnerability scanning telnet from a white hat point of view. So what we'll do is that, uh, we'll do a scan a of, of the, the threats FTP and also provided a basic so practical can see here that skills a scan in vulnerability analysis. That it's a Linux image and then it has FTP open. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll scan for the usernames and passwords with inside this. Okay, so what we have is that we have a file called login.txt and I've just added a few different user IDs, admin, test, test1 and Napier and we've created a password file, a non Napier, Fred, none password in AP123. Obviously in a real life situation there would be thousands of user IDs and passwords in here. Okay, so we're going to run Hydra. The minus L defines the user ID file. The minus P defines the password file. This is the address that we're going to scan and we're going to scan for the FTP protocol. Okay, so it's now scanning. It just takes a little minute. So what it's doing here is to go through each of the passwords and we can see here it's actually found the login name and the password. So if we wanted we could show it in a verbose format. Where it will actually show us the usernames and the passwords that it's actually testing. So can he, we can see here it tries each of our user IDs followed by the, the password. So in this way we can actually investigate our systems to see if they are vulnerable to 
attack. We can try the same for Telnet. We can see here it's trying a few, and again it's actually found out the the login name and the password. So if we wanted, we could run Wireshark to have a look at the footprint, because obviously what we want to do is, is, is to use something like Hydra to be able to see our vulnerabilities, but we also need to see if someone is actually scanning our network. So we'll run Wireshark here. And not in the Linux image. Just takes a little minute to start up. It's obviously running slightly slow because it's in a virtual image. Okay, so there are many options that we can use with. Hydra. So it's just defining a different port if it's not on a standard default port. As we can see, FTP ran on port 21, Telnet on port 23, but if there are servers running on other ports, then we can scan them too. Okay, so we'll just capture from here. some background traffic coming in. Okay, so we'll now run our Hydra attack again. And we can see here this is the trace that, that we get. So we can see lots of incoming requests. And the ones we're interested in are up here. So we can see here the this is where we're getting the communications between the, the two devices. So for example we have a look. So this is where it's asking for a password and then this is the password being passed which is none there's the password Fred and we can see now it goes on to user test it's asking for a password for test and then it's passing password user test 1 password required for test 1 and then and on and so on so eventually what we should see is a successful login for the user and that happens you can see here these are unsuccessful logins login and incorrect so eventually we should see a login correct if we just keep going down obviously we can search for this if we want Sending messages back here showing that it wasn't successful. Again, login incorrect. See it happens somewhere around here. We can obviously watch our stream. So 
is an example here of user admin password Fred user Napier password anon. Another threat which is current is related to active attacks and uh, an example of this is with uh, an SQL injection attack. In this case what we can see is that a parameter is used to get data through a, a URL and into the program. In this case, we have a variable called test, which is meant to be used to pass information. But what's actually happened is that this SQL information has not been filtered and has went straight down to the database. So when it's passed to the database, then the, the actual SQL query looks something like this. Select star from DB1. In this case, we can see here that this shows the database. So what we'll do is we'll have a look at an example of SQL injection. <laughs> 